Thank you, everyone, all of you in the room and uh, those who are watching online for joining us for an important conversation today about paid family leave and gender pay inequity in the United States. I'm Aparna Mathur, and I'm a resident scholar here in economic policy studies at AEI. Uh, the, the reason we're doing the, you know, starting this conversation is that if you look at the labor force participation rates for women, they have increased significantly over the last few decades. But data suggests that participation rates for women vary significantly over their life cycle. Uh, according to data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there is actually a 10 percentage point gap between the participation rates for women and men in their prime working age years. So in the 30s and 40s, if you look at what's happening to labor force participation for women, you know, men are 10 to 15 percentage points more likely to be in the labor market. They're much more likely to be in full-time jobs than, than women. In fact, the surprising thing is that a lot of women in, in the ages of 25 to 54 are actually 50% of them are in part-time jobs. And I, I think that speaks a lot about you know, their lifetime incomes, their careers, their uh, ability to achieve and attain their true potential. And, and the reason I think that we are seeing a lot of labor force dropouts at these ages is because women tend to have uh, you know, family responsibilities. A lot of this happens at the time of birth of a child when a lot of women drop out of the labor force entirely. It could happen because they, they don't have systems of paid leave, which allow them to take six to eight weeks uh, off from work uh, with job security, with, with, uh, pay, with a guaranteed pay, uh, and the ability to get back to the same job. And it also sh suggests that the costs of uh, childcare are really high, as a result of which a lot of women then decide, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go back to work because I need to look after you know, the child at home. It's, it's too expensive to put them in, in a daycare. So these kind of transitions in and out of the labor market really affect the types of jobs that women are able to take, which affects the women's earnings over the lifetime. So how do we make the American workplace more accepting of these challenges faced by women, and in, in particular, and working families as a whole? We're extremely pleased to welcome Senator Fisher, who will discuss her proposals for addressing these issues. She will take a few questions after, after her talk. And then we will move on to a panel discussion. So I want to begin by inviting Senator Fisher to give her remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm excited to be here at AEI. This is an important institution, not only uh, to protect free enterprise, but it also, I believe, fosters a very thoughtful debate. And today's um, program, I think, will continue that strong tradition. I'm here today to talk about two important issues affecting American families. In Nebraska and all across the country, people are worried. Whether it's hardworking parents trying to make ends meet, or grandparents who are concerned about the future that we will leave our grandchildren, there is no shortage of anxiety. I'm a firm believer in conservative principles and in limited government. I also think that Congress has a duty to promote policies that will make life easier and more flexible for American families. For the mother or the father who works full time right, while raising their three children, life has no shortage of demands and obligations. So it's time to discover how we can empower America's families with the tools that they're going to need to prosper. And today, we'll discuss two areas where I believe productive solutions and common ground are possible. Barriers still remain, whether real or perceived, which are halting this progress and limiting prosperity for the American worker, particularly women. Women across the United States have a very positive story to tell. We now hold more than half of all professional and managerial jobs, and that is double the number since 1980. We earn over 55% of the bachelor's degrees. We run nearly 10 million small businesses. 
and we serve in Congress at record levels. We've come a long way, but our work has just begun. Equal pay for equal work is a shared American value. At its core, equal pay is about basic fairness and ensuring that every woman, just like every man, has the opportunity to build the life that she chooses. Republicans fully agree that pay discrimination is wrong. We fully support existing law. For over half a century, the Equal Pay Act and the Civil Rights Act have enabled women to make significant economic strides. As such, any violations of these important laws are illegal, and they should be punished to the full extent of the law. But I believe that we can also go further. Congress has an opportunity to recommit itself to this issue and ensure that these existing laws are vigorously enforced. Our country, our country is stronger today because women have advanced in the workplace. There are stories of young women who start off in entry-level jobs and they rise to the top of the corporate ranks because someone, somewhere, has recognized their potential. There are managers and mentors committed to their team. Men and women across the workforce are focused on cultivating strengths and providing thoughtful feedback in areas that need improvement. Unfortunately, there are also stories of discrimination, of pain, and of bias. We all have friends and neighbors and sisters and mothers who were treated unfairly at some point in their careers. Silence, however, does not foster progress. I want to help every woman and every man put a stop to unfair pay practices. And this starts by breaking the barriers to open discussion. Few realize the extent of this problem. In 2003, the University of Pennsylvania conducted a study on how salaries are discussed in the private sector. The survey found over one-third of private sector employers have specific rules prohibiting employees from discussing their pay with their co-workers. Additionally, the data suggests that a significant number of employers have either a preference for or have actually instituted specific pay secrecy or confidentiality rules. This was reinforced by another survey from the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Roughly half the workers reported that discussing wages and salaries is either discouraged or prohibited and or could lead to punishment. It went on to note that pay secrecy appears to contribute to the gender gap in earnings. These studies point to a common problem one that is not only preventing progress, but also fueling anger and resentment and fear. The American workforce is lacking protections for employees to engage in an open dialogue about their salaries. To put it bluntly, Americans are afraid to ask how their salary compares to their colleagues. Meanwhile, Current law does not adequately protect workers against retaliation from employers who want to prevent those conversations about compensation. Because of this, there exists an unnecessary gap between workers who believe their compensation is biased and unfair and employers who have good reason to dread the government mandating how they're going to run their businesses. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to choose between two extremes. As the saying goes, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And if you want to know how your salary compares to your colleagues, you should have every right to ask. That's as basic as the First Amendment. 
Ensuring transparency would not only make it easier for workers to recognize pay discrimination, it would also empower them to negotiate their salaries effectively. Wage transparency is not a new initiative. It already enjoys support on both sides of the political spectrum. In fact, both President Obama and Hillary Clinton are in favor of it. Not all transparency, however, is created equally. Earlier this year, the Obama administration proposed a new regulation targeting businesses with over 100 employees. And through this rule, the Labor Department would require businesses to submit a large amounts of data regarding race, gender, and other statistics to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The administration believes that this will effectively root out discrimination. I believe that this is just another government mandate that intrudes into the operations of a private business. We can't discount the burden that this will put on employers. And with every new regulation, there is a cost. Government should never be in the business of data mining private entities for their own political goals. I also have real doubts that this new data will give the administration what it's looking for. Instead, it risks preventing or presenting a distorted picture of pay data. Moreover, it remains unclear how this information would identify discrimination. The data does not take into account other factors, including years of experience or education level or productivity that are appropriately used to determine wages. Looking at big data alone fails to tell the full story. I'm concerned that the rigid compensation structures resulting from this proposal could force businesses to provide employees with less flexibility, and that would deal a greater blow to women. Instead, we should be empowering both employers and employees to negotiate flexible work arrangements because that's going to best meet individual needs. I agree that we have more work to do on equal pay. The way to make meaningful and lasting progress isn't through misguided executive actions that could hurt women. To make a difference in the lives of working families, we have to focus on building a bipartisan consensus. And I've been working to do just that by collaborating with my colleagues and generating support for my bill, which is known as the Workplace Advancement Act. I believe that every American worker should have the ability to discuss compensation without fear of retribution. This legislation breaks down the barriers to open dialogue and allows employees to ask questions and gain information. Access to this information could enable workers to be their own best advocates and then negotiate for the salaries that they feel they deserve. Knowledge is power. By freely discussing their wages, workers can negotiate effectively for the pay that they want. My proposal has received support from almost every Senate Republican and also five Democrats. But as we know all too well, in Washington, anything that receives bipartisan support uh, stalls with five words. It doesn't go far enough. The biggest critics of this plan suggest that it's too modest. They claim that transparency is only the first step, and the second requires mandates. The truth is, meaningful change cannot happen without action and compromise. And by its very definition, 
It requires both agreement and accommodation. My bill can make a real difference, and it can make a difference for American workers. And unlike the legislation that's being proposed by Democrats, my bill can actually pass. Others would argue that this change is unnecessary because the right to discuss salaries is protected under existing law. While it's true that certain employees and certain conversations are protected, there is no reason why we can't apply the same freedom to all Americans. As I discussed previously, surveys suggest over one-third of private sector companies have specific prohibitions in place. I'm encouraged by the support that we've already garnered on both sides of the aisle. This needed, straightforward change to our equal pay laws is achievable. The purpose of our legislative process is to find solutions that both Republicans and Democrats can achieve for the American people. This all or nothing attitude only prevents progress and it leaves us with the false choices and stereotypes that have persisted for decades. We now have a real opportunity to make a difference for both men and women who work hard every day to provide for their families. And above all, we can help them succeed and prosper in the workforce while being secure in the knowledge that they are compensated fairly for their work. Meanwhile, the needs of the American workforce are changing. From young parents who are spending time with newborns to adults who are caring for their aging or ailing parents, life can be stressful. We have more demands and we have less time. Employers are caught in the middle of this reality as they seek to run profitable businesses while respecting the family needs of their employees. The debate over how to address this problem has occurred in cities and states throughout this country for decades. Recently, the issue came to the forefront here in Washington, D.C. The City Council is considering a new policy that would give workers up to 16 weeks of paid time off to care for a newborn child or an elderly family member. According to a survey last fall by the Washington Post, 82% of district residents support employers footing the bill for that paid leave, but less than 45% would support it if the workers were required to pay. So in other words, everyone loves the principle of pay lead, but nobody wants to pay for it. Providing leave for workers to care for young children or our ailing loved ones, that's not a new idea. In fact, for large employers, it's already the law. The challenge, though, for many working families, particularly those hourly workers who live paycheck to paycheck, is that current law does not address this. The conversation about paid leave has shifted as the makeup of the workforce has shifted. Today, mothers serve as the primary breadwinners in about 40% of all households. Businesses are starting to recognize this reality and they're changing their policies accordingly. For example, companies in Silicon Valley are offering generous paid time off for parents. These innovative companies understand that offering more flexible options to meet those family obligations will help them attract and retain talented employees. Our aging population also means many more American workers are faced with those increasing family responsibilities. According to Pew Research, there are 40.4 million unpaid caregivers for adults 65 and older in the United States. They work full-time jobs, but they are also full-time caregivers to their aging parents. These families don't call it a burden. 
but it is an exhausting job and it requires a great deal of time and energy. For those fortunate to work for employers who offer paid leave, achieving a work-life balance, well, it's much easier. But the vast majority of Americans face no-win situations. They are forced to choose between their families and their career obligations. Working Americans want flexibility. They want this flexibility to meet their family demands. And employers want certainty to meet their bottom line. I believe it's possible to find a middle ground on this issue, one that respects both families and employers, and one that will move this nation forward. So last November, I joined with Senator Angus King of Maine to reintroduce our bill that encourages employers to voluntarily offer paid leave to their employees. Our bipartisan proposal, known as the Strong Families Act, offers a way forward through addressing the dilemma facing working Americans without punishing businesses. It does so by offering incentives to businesses that voluntarily provide paid leave for their employees in the form of tax credits. The 25% non-refundable tax credit in our bill is intended to incentivize employers who would otherwise be unable to offer any paid leave at all to their employees. We can't forget that when employees take time off, whether for health or other reasons, there is a cost to the employer. And there is a cost to the employees who must step in and step up to fill a new role. By softening the financial blow for employers, particularly those smaller employers who really struggle with this dilemma, we can help lower wage or non-salaried employees receive paid time off. Notably, this bill does not create a mandate from the federal government. As a result, some reject the idea because, as we've heard before, they believe it doesn't go far enough. But there are real costs in mandating paid leave. The American Action Forum and Doug, who's here today as one of our panelists, have done some great work calculating the cost of a mandate. They found that the Family, Family Act, a proposal from my friends on the other side, mandates 12 weeks of paid family leave, and it would cost anywhere from $160 billion to $997 billion. Proponents of this legislation point out that the payroll tax for the creation of this new program would be very small amounting to a maximum employee contribution of about $4 a week. That's true. But just like every new benefit proposed by the government, nothing is free. According to the American Action Forum, the legislation's payroll tax would only raise $30.6 billion, meaning this tax would only cover between 3.1% and 19.2% of these projected costs. So ultimately, the Family Act would create a giant new entitlement program that can't cover its costs. Instead, we need to find creative ways to incentivize businesses to provide these benefits to the workers who need them. It's time to have a constructive conversation about how we can make paid leave possible for more American families. The Independent Women's Forum recently conducted a study on, on what really matters to women when they choose a job. They found flexibility to be the common theme. Whether providing flexible schedules or offering alternatives like telecommuting, women valued flexibility at about the same level as receiving 10 paid vacation and six, sick days or receiving five to $10,000 in extra income. 
The survey shows what many of us already knew. Every situation is different. And by providing more options, workers can determine how each can suit their own particular needs. Rigid mandates can actually hurt their ability to negotiate unique arrangements with their employers. It also shows that while the demographics of the American workforce are changing, so are the needs and desires of American workers. Rather than pushing for a permanent change to the tax code, Senator King and I are proposing a responsible, paid-for pilot program to gain accurate information and use it then to form a permanent solution. It's our hope and it's our belief that this tax credit can make a real difference by creating more opportunities for paid leave across the country. No one should live in the fear that welcoming a new baby or taking an elderly parent to the doctor could mean losing their job. This reasonable legislation can make a meaningful difference in the lives of American families, and particularly those with already limited opportunities. Whether it's equal pay or paid leave, the issues that matter to American workers are evolving. This progress demands solutions. I believe that we can achieve meaningful change that will allow both employers, employees, to grow our economy. And we can do it without punishing mandates or picking winners and losers. We owe it to the American people to discover shared solutions that can lead to stronger families and stronger communities. And by working together, I'm confident we will not only succeed, but we will thrive as a nation. I thank you again for having me here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Senator, uh, we'll start with questions. Do we have a mic? Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Who did you say? Thanks, Senator. Hello. Um, my main concern is that legislation is good, and this legislation is is also good. The problem is that in come to like implementation, usually have problems. Like the federal government, they also have paid leave, seek leave, but they don't allow employee to use it. They deny it, and they temper the record, and so eventually, just like this discrimination complaint, go not only nowhere, take decades, and eventually, even if you want, they go to the Supreme Court twice and done. And even if you want, you got no remedy, no resolution, and uh, instead, it's just like torture mechanism. You lost uh, all your assets and resources. And then this going on and on for all the discrimination, all the victimization. So I just wonder if the, in the, in the, in the Congress can really do something and force uh, us, the uh, Department of Justice or EEOC, really enforce the law and really uh, resolve the problem rather than all the disservice in our economy, so it doesn't make sense. It's necessary to enforce the current laws that we have. I agree with you on that. I would also say on the paid family leave proposal, um, one, of the, one of the best parts of that that Senator King and I think will be very, very helpful is that two-year pilot program so that we, we can have information on how many businesses are going to access that uh, tax credit that we would make available. I think that will be good information to have. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's Ariane Higovich, Institute for Women's Policy Research, and, and thank you for your remarks. I also have a question about enforcement. <coughs> 
Excuse me. As I understand the new EOC proposals for, to collect more pay data, um, they are specifically designed to build on a form that has been around for 40 years that employers know, but also is, are not meant to get rid of what employers usually do to make sure that pay is fair. So they don't judge individual employers, but they make it easier to really weed out those that look OK and therefore reduce burden and to focus on the employers who might have a problem. And they can maybe be able to employ, um, explain it, or they may not. But as you say, there is huge suspicion on equal pay. And some of that is not just not knowing, but some of it is discrimination. So I just wonder how we could make that process more efficient, which the EOC is hoping to do with the new data? Um, well, I think first of all is to have a um, more streamlined form. It's my understanding there's uh, like 100 cells on this form looking for all sorts of data. Um, this is a burden. And, it, and then what is the government going to do with all the information? I certainly appreciate uh, uh, the government doing studies. I appreciate all of you when you do your studies. But um, I'm a policymaker. I'm a legislator. I want to be able to take information and, and put it to use. And after a while, data collecting um, has to stop. It has to stop, and we have to put proposals forward where we're going to be able to see some real change. And I, again, recognize the importance of it, but I think more importantly is that we need to recognize the need now to move forward. Um, morning, Senator. Um, my name is uh, Titch Pasi. I'm a first year MBA student at Georgetown University. Um, and I'm also from Zimbabwe, so it's, it's interesting yeah. to, to see a different perspective in, from an American context. Um, I think, first of all, um, uh, one thing that strikes me is uh, I think for most of the world, uh, some of these issues seem quite obvious that you know, paid leave and uh, maternity leave and time off and things like that are uh, legislated. Um, one of the worries I, I, or perhaps you could comment on, in trying to balance out uh, uh, making a, a, a man mandated uh, a law versus one that's voluntary, wouldn't there be some form of uh, self-selection bias to say those companies that already value flexibility uh, um, or you know some form of advancement or equal pay would be the ones that would voluntarily take up this measure and the ones that actually remain being a problem uh, will simply do nothing about it for whatever reason. Let's assume the worst possible company that doesn't want to have equal pay. If it's voluntary, would you not still have uh, the, the companies that are already perhaps making efforts towards that, um, continuing to make efforts and those that don't care or don't want to, just don't, um, yeah. I think with our uh, with the policy on equal pay specifically, as I said, the the president and Hillary Clinton agree with the non-retaliation part of uh, my proposal, and to me that's the most important part, and that's one where we've reached agreement. We've uh, we've seen it pass with Republicans and Democrats support. Uh, we're we're able to get something passed. It reinforces current law, but then it also provides, provides workers with the knowledge. And to give women that confidence that they would need in, in having the knowledge to negotiate with facts, I think is very important. Um, you, I think you kind of uh, referred to the paid family leave also in there. Senator King and I, when we, um, when we were working on the proposal, I, I believe one of the main objectives was to be able to have a focus on small businesses. And I don't know any small business owners that, that don't want to provide paid family leave. But you also have to remember that small businesses, by definition, are small. And in many parts of my state, of Nebraska, these are family businesses. It is very difficult for them uh, to, to make ends meet now. 
and to be mandated to provide it, um, it would be hard. Also, in many of these small businesses, you have hourly employees. They're not addressed, I don't believe, under current law. We want to focus on that. So if if a hourly paid worker needs to take their child to a doctor's appointment, this would provide a pathway where they would be able to do that, where they would need to take their parent to, to renew a driver's license, uh, to any anything like that, um, we need to address that population, and that was a focus of our legislation. And I think it is. Um, I think it's an important focus. I think it's a positive focus. I think it's an overlooked focus. Why you why you always hear the the grand scheme on any of the important issues out there that are facing us. Again, it's getting down to the nuts and bolts and, and find a way to make policy work for people. Senator, can I take this opportunity to ask Certainly. one last question, maybe? Under the current paid leave programs, I think one of the issues that states are facing is that a lot of people would qualify only if they also qualified for the FMLA. And so even if they take leave, it's not job protected all the time. You know, it's, uh, and, and oftentimes the employer says, well, you need to take your paid sick days or you need to take your paid vacation days. And how does your proposal address who qualifies for the, for the leave? Because on the FMLA, you have to have you know, more than 1,000 hours with the employer and you need to fill, fill a lot of criteria. So how would your proposal change that? Uh, you would still have to qualify under under the existing conditions, uh, but it it would be able to allow then for the hourly employees. Okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll move straight to our panels. I would love to get our panelists on. So let's move on to our panel discussion where we allow our panelists to discuss the proposals that Senator Fisher just uh, talked about and also offer their comments and their opinions on ways of addressing issues of gender pay inequity and uh, paid family leave. Uh, to, uh, so let me just introduce them quickly. I'm sure you've all seen them and heard of them. Um, Heather Boucher is Ex Executive Director and Chief Economist at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Her research focus, uh, focuses on economic inequality and public policy, specifically employment, social policy, and family economic well-being. She is the author of Finding Time, The Economics of Work-Life Conflict, published by the Harvard University Press uh, and coming out in April. Douglas Holtzikin has a distinguished record as an academic, policy advisor, and strategist. Currently, he is the president of the American Action Forum and most recently was a commissioner on the congressionally chartered Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Since 2001, <coughs> he has served in a variety of important policy positions. He was the sixth director of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office from 2003 to 2005. And last but not least, we have Isabel Sawhill, is a nationally recognized social policy expert focusing on domestic poverty and federal fiscal policy with a special interest in family formation behavior. She's a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, and she has served as vice president and director of economic studies at Brookings and as co-director of the Center on Children and Families and the Budgeting for National Priorities Project at Brookings. She is the author most recently of Generation Unbound, Drifting into Sex and Parenthood Without Marriage. So I welcome you all, and I would, uh, you know, Heather, why don't we start with you? Just get your comments on the proposals and your ideas on these issues. Thanks. Wonderful. 
Oh, do I have to do anything? No, I don't have to do anything here. Um, well, so thank you. Thank you so much, Aparna, um, for inviting me here today. And um, Senator Fisher's uh, comments, I think she's left, um, I thought were really um, quite interesting, and I was really glad to hear a lot of them. Um, so I want to just start by noting, um, it seems to me, uh, in listening to the senator, there's a number of things that we agree on and a number of things that we don't agree on. So um, it was good to hear that we agree on many of the facts. Um, that uh, this issue around women's work um, is important for families. It's also important to the economy. Um, let me just add a few points on that. Um, that you know the way that I've been thinking about it, you know, uh, and, and echoed in many of your remarks and what the senator said. That you know these are issues that are important for getting people into work. It's important that we have the kinds of supports that families need in order to make work possible when they have caretaking responsibilities. If we expect all adults um, with either children or aging or sick family members to work, it's important for economic demand that family members be able to earn decent income so that they can be active and productive family member, uh, you know, uh, members of our economy. And it's also important for productivity inside firms. So all of these ways, it's really economically important. And just one fact out there, um, some research that I did a couple of years ago, we found that if you look at the rise in women's hours of work between 1979 and I think what we looked at was through 2012, we found that that alone accounted for about 11% of the growth of GDP, was just simply the rising hours of women's employment. So this isn't just about families, this is about our entire economy. Um, and it was good to hear many sort of echoes of those themes. Um, it was also good to hear that we agree that um, pay discrimination is wrong um, and that we're in support of it, that we the agreement in support of existing law. That's really important. Um, I want to just, and I'll go through both of them separately, uh, and I'll start with the, I'll just go in the, senator, the order that the senator did, start with the equal pay issues and then go on to the, the um, paid leave issues. So um, I think I want to make four points on um, the solutions for equal pay. So first, um, it is true that the um, that President Obama and um, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and others um, on the Democratic side have put forth the idea that um, pay transparency is critical to being able to address pay inequities. Um, and actually, I will just say from my own perspective in my own career, um, very early on, one of my male colleagues took me aside and explained to me how it worked at our organization and what I should ask for when I went in um, and had my annual review. And that was one of the most important moments in my career um, in terms of my pay because I had no idea what my colleagues were making and I had no idea what I should ask for. That was in my first job. Um, I will also note that, that that colleague was my union rep. And so he had access to everybody's pay and also knew how to talk to me about it in a way that wasn't sort of inflammatory or problematic, but that was really thoughtful and kind of went through some of the steps. And so I think one, um, one thing that we need to think about is actually how firms do this is really important. I don't know that we, that we haven't talked about that, so I don't know there's disagreement there. But, um, but the thing is, is that how you let people talk about it and what the anti-retaliation provisions are, are very important. And I think one concern in the, um, the Workplace Advancement Act is that it only allows people to talk about this in pursuit of equal pay. And there's very specific language. So it isn't just pay transparency, like you can talk to your, your colleagues about pay generally, but you have to use specific words and under specific conditions. And the reality is, is that most workers may not understand that. Most workers don't have a union rep to even ask those questions of. And so I think that is actually a big point of disagreement because it's great that we agree that you should be able to talk about it, but I think it needs to be expansive enough so that the worker that has never heard of this conversation, that isn't a legal expert, actually doesn't walk into a minefield that they don't know anything about because they're like, oh, I can talk about my pay, but didn't know that they had to use certain magic words. That, I think, is really, really important. Um, second, on the um, on the survey with the, with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, so I'm an economist. I like running regressions and looking at big data. And one thing that I know about this is that one of the ways that we understand what discrimination looks like is by understanding sort of the aggregate impact, what, you know, what it looks like across a wide array of firms and a wide array of jobs. And the intent and goal of the survey is to be able to give um, the government but also workers the tools to know um, at a broader level what is discrimination and what isn't. And so I think there are... Um, 
there are always, de there's, you know, the dev as we all know, devil's in the details. So how this survey is conducted that gathers information from employers, it's, um, and my understanding is that they're still in the comment period. We should have, continue to have a lively discussion about it, but I do want to sort of put a marker out there that having access to data is what allows us to understand that there's a problem, and as the questioner, Georgetown or GW? Georgetown. Georgetown. So uh, as the Georgetown questioner, Georgetown. yeah, I know, I know exactly, right? <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, but so as, as the questioner asks, you know, the, 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 um, whether or not um, uh, how we know and whether or not it's targeted at specific firms rather than just any firm is an important target. We want government resources targeted at the bad players, not on all the good players, and the data would allow us to do that. Okay, third, and I'm gonna try to run through these quickly because I feel like I'm taking up too much time here. So um, third, the Paycheck Fairness Act, which is the other piece of legislation that does this, um, that's been introduced on the Democratic side, um, acknowledges that one of the things we see in the literature is that women are really terrible at negotiating. And I say that with a bit of a giggle because it's kind of silly that women don't actually know how to get out there and ask for what they deserve. And one of the ways we know that is that the pay gap starts the minute that women get into the labor market. There's been a number of studies that show, comparing apples to apples, if Doug and I were in the same class in school, we took the same econ classes, we had the same major, we got the same kind of job, and this, I, I don't know, this did not actually happen, I'm just using this because I'm sitting next to a man. If we took a job, the studies show that I would be paid like 5% less just getting out of school relative to men that had the same kind of training. That, that is, and when we know that there's path dependency, whatever job you start at, that follows you through the rest of your career. You start here, and then even if you all increase at 5% a year, you start at a lower level. So that's really important. So giving women the tools to negotiate and the power of information is really important, and that's a piece in the Paycheck Fairness Act that is not in the Workplace Advancement Act that um, Senator Fisher talked about. Um, okay, moving on to paid family leave. Uh, so I'm very invested in the Family Act. I've spent a lot of time working and writing on uh, the bill introduced by Senator Gillibrand um, uh, that, that, that Senator Fisher um, uh, uh, remarked on a number of times, and I'm so excited to, to push back on a number of things. First of all, I cannot tell you how exciting it is to be here having this conversation um, on left and right agreeing that paid family leave is an important issue for families and for our economy. I mean, I, I mean, it sends chills down my spine. I've been waiting for this for so long. So I'm so excited that we're having this conversation. And of course, the devil's in the details. So let's, I relish the discussion on how we get there. So first off, there are three states in the United States that have paid family leave. California, New Jersey, Rhode Island. Washington has passed it, but they haven't been able to implement it. So we have three states, and we can learn a lot from what has happened in those states. It's not unknown, it's not a mystery, and in fact, in California, it's been in place for over a decade. So we have a lot of information about what works <laughs> and what doesn't. And I would strongly encourage us to start our debate about a federal program from a deep dive and an understanding of what's worked and what hasn't in those states. So, number one, they've done it through a payroll tax on employees. And how many people even knew that those states had paid family leave? Okay, good, mo excellent, the majority. So, that's great. But so I would, so what we know though about those states is that take up hasn't been as high as we expected, primarily because the people in those states don't actually all know about it. So even though they're being taxed more, they haven't, it hasn't sort of infiltrated into the, the public consciousness. So that can either tell you that that's a waste of resources or it can tell you that that tax wasn't so big that it actually really mattered all that much that it got people sort of moving. Um, but, uh, so it's a payroll tax. The second is it's a social insurance, just like the way we fund a whole bunch of other things that we do, like Social Security or unemployment insurance, although that has a different sort of tax structure. That's the model that we used um, in those three states. And uh, according to a brand new paper released um, by uh, a number of top scholars in this field, Chris Room, Jane Wadfogel, and three others, um, uh, that was that just came out uh, uh, recently, um, looking at the first decade after California's law, 
Um, the evidence, and this has been studied now by a number of different teams of scholars, the evidence is that the law did not cause problems for businesses in that state. The vast majority, roughly 90 percent, um, report positive effects or no effects in terms of productivity, profitability, retention, and morale. Small employers, in fact, in, in more than one survey, have reported fewer problems. Why is this? Well, it's in some ways what Senator Fisher said. I'm a small employer. Many small employers, um, if they have somebody that has a family emergency, they're going to let that person leave. They're not going to, they're going to be like, that person's having a baby. They're, you know, most good people aren't going to say, come back to work the day after your baby's born, or I don't care if your mom's in the hospital dying, right? Good employers are going to, they're going to let that employee go. This program in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, you know what it does? It lets the employer let that person go, and the social insurance fund gives that employee the pay that they need. So it separates the two. The small employer already has a problem when the employee has a family problem. What the social insurance program does is it solves the employee's problem, which then makes it easier on the employer. They're no longer under pressure to pay for that employee, but they, of course, still have to deal with the employee's absence. But for the most part, they already had to do that. So, so that's why it that's why it actually is a relief to many small employers to know that that's just one thing they don't have to deal with. Um, and Doug, on the study um, that you did, and I so appreciate your energy and attention to this issue. Thank you. Um, and now, having said that, um, I, I live to excite. I, yes. live, I live to excite you. Yes, yes, that. yes. Um, so, uh, so having been, you know, on the side of putting together the estimate for how much the Family Act would cost, um, the way we did that math was fairly simple. We looked at the states that already had a program and built up the model and the expenses from there alongside some modeling that had been done um, at the national level if we implemented a 12-week program. That was at that time when we did it, it was dated. I will note that in the states that have implemented over time, the, um, they have overestimated, they actually overestimated the initial tax costs and it wasn't actually as expensive over time. So I, I agree that that was, um, that was not, uh, uh, I agree that that was an estimate. Right? And, we, and we used the best available data. But I felt that looking at the states that had already implemented the program to start from that estimate was the right place to start. I stand by that. I think that is the most serious and credible way to do it. Finally, I'm going to lose my last like 30 seconds here. Tax credits. Tax credits are awesome, except when they're voluntary. Um, so people don't, it is not going to be my choice if my mom gets sick and I need to take time off work to go and help her. I will not choose that. And in fact, it makes me feel, I, I know, it's a horrible example to use because I really hope my mother never gets sick and I have to take off time to, to go and help her, right? And when that happens, I will do that. And I hope that I, well, because I, I am my own boss, I, I hope that my employer will let me go and, and not make me lose too much money. Um, but having, but relying on a voluntary tax credit from an employer, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for the millions of families that have to provide care for their family members. In a world where everyone works, it's just not good enough. And the other thing is that there are a lot of fantastic firms out there that are already doing the right thing. One thing we know about them is that they're more likely to give it to their professional workers or people at the top. They don't give it to everybody. Netflix, wonderful example. I love Netflix. I use it almost every night. They, announced, they made this big announcement, how they're going to do paid family medical leave. Super awesome. Oh, wait. When the first announcement came out, except for the low-wage workers that were putting the little CDs in the sleeves, it didn't, no, 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 no not, not you. You don't get it. Well, why would you do that? That's not, it's fundamentally not <laughs> fair. The role of policy, our job is to make sure that the system is fair and that no one is discriminated against. And that means making sure that we've set the floor. I probably used it more than my time, but I feel passionate about that. Sorry. So... Um, well, Aparna, thank you for the chance to be here in this conversation and to excite Heather, which is um, my mission. Um, uh, let me talk about the, fa the family leave um, issue. Um, and first of all, on, on the estimate, it, ours was just a boundary. Right? What's yeah. the upper and the lower bound, given all the things that are difficult to, to guess about this? And so you know, what I want to really do is just give a, a quick shout out to a paper that my colleague Ben Giddes did. Um, it's on our website called "What You Know What We uh, Know About Paid Family Leave and in the Private Sector," and, and more importantly, it tells us what we don't know. We have these three states, but 
But at the national level, we really have this survey from the uh, DOL, the National Compensation Survey, and it tells us some things that, that you just heard and, and I think are unsurprising but, but are the reality. First of all, this is not a particularly prevalent uh, form of compensation, um, and it is concentrated much more among highly compensated employees than, than, than the low-wage folks, right? 23% of the highly compensated get the offer, 5% of the low-wage guys do. So this, this is a, a big difference. Um, it is more prevalent in large firms than in small firms, and um, uh, that, that's a, a stylized fact. Uh, full-time folks get it, part-time folks don't, right? Again, big, big difference there. Um, one difference we thought we'd see, we didn't, is union, non-union, and they're about the same. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. So that, that, that's um, sort of the, the good news. We know those things, and that's a pretty short list, I'll point out. Now, here's some things we don't know, which you might want to know, I think, um, before you uh, decide how to run the world. Um, first, what's the take-up of, of this? We, we have data on the offer, but we don't know how many people take up, and that's going to drive the, the ultimate cost of this more than anything else. Second thing we don't know is, given that people use it, the take-up family leave, What's the duration? You might be, you know, offered 12 weeks. You might not use all 12 weeks. And so, what is the what are the patterns of take up and, and um, usage? Um, how long do you have to be on the job to ge get vested essentially in family uh, leave? So, you know, do you have to work for a year? Do you have to work for a month? What are the patterns on, on that? Um, what are the characteristics of the households that these workers live in? Are they folks who have a, a spouse or, or a partner who has access to family leave? Don't know. Are the, are the households more affluent, less affluent? We know something about the characteristics of the job, but that often doesn't tell you very much about the characteristics of the household. And it would be really nice to get some more information about that. Uh, and we also don't know at this point how much of basically disguised family leave is being cobbled together out of using your sick days and your holidays and you, know, your, you get a, some uh, time off uh, for vacation, you know, you, you could have a fairly um, uh, vibrant family leave culture out there that's just being labeled something else. And it would be nice to know sort of the, those kinds of characteristics. And, and that would help us in, in sort of the design issues. And, and I, I, I don't have a religious conviction on, on any of this. I think it's a very important issue. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and have this discussion. But there are some threshold decisions, I think, you have to, to decide, and, and clearly, you know, Heather and the, and the Family Act designers made one of those. They, they decided not to vest this in the firm, right? This is a social insurance product in that view. It's a payroll tax financed um, uh, uh, leave. One of the things that does is it essentially makes it portable. When individuals trans, you know, sort of have these transitions in and out from firm to firm, which are all things we have valued in the U.S. labor market, it's, it's flexibility, it's vibrancy, um, you can make those transitions. So you have to decide, are you going to put it in the firm, maybe force people to work for a firm for a year before they get it, or are they going to have access to it no matter where they are? You could also put it, you know, in some, in some proposals, it's essentially a tax-preferred benefit that the individual accrues. Like they have an account, you could carry that account around. But you have to decide whether you're going to do it in the firm or do it at the individual. I worry about the firm approach. I'll be honest about my, my concern. You know, Post-World War II, we made the firm the vessel of a lot of social benefits, and, and it hasn't stood up very well. Pensions, uh, health insurance, all of that was, was organized around the firms. It's not obvious if we were starting the world again from scratch, we should do it that way. And so I think that's worth thinking about pretty hard. Um, the second thing is, um, if you're going to do it at the firm level, are you going to have a mandate? Right? You know, one thing you can do is mandate that firms provide 12, 16, whatever it may be, uh, weeks of paid family leave. If you do that, I think it's very important to recognize that you are going to make the workers pay for their own leave. Uh, in the end, over time, you're going to see this mandate for a compensation be offset by re reduced wages. And I worry about the rigidity and the inflexibility of such an approach. There are times in my life when I really would have liked some family leave when I was raising my kids. Right now, it's not a big consideration for me. Later, it may yet be again. And so even during my life, a rigid mandate where I took, had to take non-cash compensation in this form doesn't appeal to me very much. And so um, if you're going to have some sort of uh, mandated set of benefits, I've always thought we should you know, basically say, here are the things we're going to give a tax-preferred status to or, or a mandated status to, health insurance, family leave, life insurance, whatever it may be, and let the individual 
take whatever value of compensation they're going to get in that form and arrange it for what they want. Right? So I'll take a less health insurance this year. I'd like to take some family leave. I'll take more health insurance this year. I don't need my leave. That kind of flexibility, I think, should be part of the system if you're going to put it in, in the, inside the firm and make um, uh, the, these mandates. Or you could do basically the tax credit approach where you say, you know, we'll offset uh, some of the cost and, and um, you'll get less prevalence and you'll get um, less wage offset out of that kind of an approach. And so I think, you know, this is clearly a very important issue. I think it's um, something that um, deserves a, a lot of uh, thought and consideration in the design and where we come down has big implications for for the labor market. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's worth thinking hard about how we do this. And I'll sort of close there by just saying, you know, I, I sure hope there's no one in this room watching or residing in the United States who thinks discriminating on pay is a good idea. So let's just put that aside for the moment. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think uh, everything that needed to be said has been said. It's just that not everyone has said it yet. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll chime in here. Um, uh, I thought both of your comments were really great and uh, agreed with a huge amount of it. I think the good news here, just to uh, reiterate, uh, that in this very, very divided country right now with such toxic politics, the really good news is we have some consensus on this issue. And uh, whether we should have paid leave or not is not really a big debate anymore. It's really what form should it take? How should we design such a program? And so I think what I like so much about both Heather and Doug's comments and also the work that you've done on this, Aparna, is that it's digging into trying to think hard about uh, the design issues. And Doug, I just think you're so right that we shouldn't uh, march down the road to a new uh, mandated benefit without thinking hard about what impacts it's going to have, uh, not just on uh, families and the economy, as Heather so uh, eloquently stressed, but also on uh, how uh, firms operate and, and the economy more generally. So. Um, I, I, like uh, everybody else here, I think, um, am in favor of uh, some form of paid family leave. We're the only advanced country that doesn't have paid family leave. Just to emphasize something that I think uh, Heather was trying to say and uh, that you said at the beginning, Aparna, um, the labor force participation of women is now critical to the light, to the to the well-being of middle class and working class families, if you don't have two earners in today's economy, you're really going to struggle to achieve the American dream. Uh, and it is only the increased labor force participation of women that has prevented even uh, a more disastrous uh, story about what's been happening to middle class incomes. Uh, there is some uh, evidence from the academic research that one of the reasons that the labor force participation of women has slowed and actually declined some since about 2000 is because unlike our European counterparts, for example, uh, we don't have paid family leave and other supports that make it more possible for people to combine work and family responsibilities. So, you know, if in this political season there's a lot of emphasis on economic growth, there's a lot of emphasis on how the middle class is doing, uh, we need to focus on these issues that have some uh, ability to move the needle on uh, labor force participation, uh, growth, and middle class incomes. Uh, there's also evidence, by the way, that paid leave really improves uh, the well-being, the health and well-being of babies and, and children. So that's a whole other reason to be in favor of it. Uh, now, that doesn't mean we should go, you know, wild about this. Uh, I had, wrote a piece uh, with Harry Holzer uh, for the Washington Post about the uh, D.C. plan. Uh, Harry is much more familiar with it than I am, but basically we were quite critical that, you know, yes, we should do this, but we should be careful about how we do it. So there are two different approaches right now to sort of summarize. Uh, the Republican approach exemplified by what you heard from Senator Fisher, 
uh, and which has been picked up, by the way, by uh, Senator Rubio. And since Senator Rubio, until recently, well. was <laughs> running for president, um, uh, you know, uh, he didn't talk about it that much. But, you know, I just want to note that, you know, it, there, there was a <clears throat> Republican presidential candidate who was in favor of this. And that approach, as you've just heard, is to use a voluntary approach and a business tax credit to encourage <clears throat> more paid leave. And then there's more the approach exemplified by uh, both Clinton and Sanders in the presidential campaign and by the uh, Gillibrand DeLauro uh, bill that Heather uh, referenced and evidently was an architect of, uh, which mandates paid leave and pays for it with a, uh, with a payroll tax. Um, uh, Secretary Clinton, by the way, has, has uh, eschewed the um, payroll tax approach and says that she's going to get the money by taxing uh, the wealthy. Uh, there are um, some good things that I like about the Fisher King proposal. So since we were invited here to respond <laughs> to that, I want to say that uh, I like the fact that it recognizes the need for a policy to keep pace with this, these dramatic changes in the uh, labor force. Um, I like the fact that it's simple and straightforward. I really am tired of really convoluted uh, policy designs uh, when they're not necessarily needed. It offers a carrot rather than a stick. I think that's a plus. And it covers small employers and part-time workers along with military families. So there's a lot to, to like here. At the same time, I think it does raise some uh, questions that need to be discussed. You know, the first is, is a 25% tax credit a big enough incentive? Is it going to really change uh, employer behavior? behavior? They're still covering 75% of the costs. Um, you know, we don't have... Uh, a lot of evidence, Doug probably knows more about this than I do, that other employer tax credits have changed behavior a lot. I think you've written about yeah. that as well, Aparna. They haven't. Uh, it would be, as I understand it, in addition to existing uh, paid leave uh, policies. And, uh, but if an uh, employer, especially those larger ones, uh, are already providing paid leave, it's going to be a windfall for them. Mm -hmm. right. And we know a lot about business tax credits and windfall. Uh, it's a problem, and it should be focused on. I don't have an estimate, but uh, I'm uh, surprised that the issue hasn't been uh, discussed. Maybe it is in your papers. Um, then there's the question, um, and I think Doug alluded to this as well, is who's going to end up paying for these tax subsidies? Yeah. I mean, you know, business tax credits aren't free. You know, either they add to the debt and the deficit, or they have to be paid for some way. They could be paid for by cutting some other business subsidy, but they could also be paid for by cutting benefits for low-income families, and we're hearing a lot about that now, or they could be paid for uh, by, um, uh, you know, some other uh, tax change that would affect working in middle class people adversely. So, you know, we know nothing about the distributional implications, even the you know, sort of static fiscal distribution implications, uh, until we know how it's going to be paid for. I didn't hear um, any uh, information coming out. Uh, is there something in the bill, maybe somebody will clarify, uh, in, in Senator Fisher and King's bill about how they would pay for this. No. no. I mean, if it was part of a uh, major tax reform package covering both corporate and individual taxes, and I liked the way it was paid for, then I'd have a different opinion about it than if I didn't like the way it was paid for. Um, so there's also this issue of even uh, it, it, sort of the final incidents I mean, if you have a uh, new payroll tax or a new, or you're saying to businesses, you've got to pay 75% of the costs, who ends up really paying this? Do they employees. pass this backward to into the, in the form of lower wages to their employees? Um, yep. They probably do. Yep. 
so, you know, I think we need to uh, compare it to some of the other designs that are out there, both at the state level and also in the federal legislation put forward by Gillibrand and DeLauro on the other side, which is, by the way, paid for with a, at least they're explicit about how they pay mm -hmm. for it, they pay for it with a payroll tax of 0.2% on mm -hmm. both the employee and the employer, for those of you who don't know. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I think Senator Fisher emphasized quite a lot, uh, and rightly so, is, you know, we need to bring small businesses, including family-owned businesses, into the picture here. But then the, the tax, even as she's talking about it, is non-refundable. Yeah. And so, you know, there are going to be a lot of small businesses, especially family-owned businesses, maybe, who are not going to be able to uh, access it. Um, so let's see. And um, finally, uh, this is just a personal interest of mine, but it might interest you. Uh, I read a paper, maybe not the same one you were alluding to, I'm not sure, Heather, by uh, Bartels, Room, Walt Fogel, and a couple of other people the about the California experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me about their study is looking at the impacts on men. Yeah. Uh, and 30% of the claims in California are from dads, not moms. Mm -hmm. well, I and I think this is yeah. very interesting. And in Europe, like especially in Norway and yeah. Sweden and in the province of Quebec and Canada, they have had a special set aside for fathers. In other words, it's a kind of lose it or, l use it or lose it uh, for fathers. And so it really encourages, it's a sort of affirmative action for fathers, if you will. And um, the, there's a wonderfully good paper by a uh, professor at Toronto on the Quebec experience that shows a huge increase in father leave taking. And not only did the fathers take, uh, I think their rates of leave taking went from 20 something to 70 something. I mean, it was a huge jump. And more importantly, in my view, after the program was over, or after the leave was over, they continued to spend more time um, <laughs> in child care than uh, before. And she has a pretty good uh, methodology here that enables us to think that this wasn't just a self-selection uh, problem issue. Uh, so I think um, it's important if we care about uh, equity for women, including pay equity, and I haven't said any much about the pay equity issue because I really didn't know we were going to talk about it today. Yeah. I'm all for pay equity. <laughs> uh, but um, that if we really care about it, we do have to care about whether or not there's a more equal sharing of work in the home in order to enable uh, women to move forward in their careers without this extra uh, burden. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank, thank you all for your comments. So let me start with some of the questions that I have, and then we'll open up to the audience. Uh, Doug, you mentioned about the take-up rate of these programs. Actually, we did, I did some back-of-the-envelope calculations, which, uh, which actually the Tax Policy Center also did when they were trying to score uh, Senator Rubio's plan mm -hmm. on you know, what would the take-up rate be of the tax credit. And so the widely cited number that you see is, well, 12% of wage and salary employees have access to paid leave, but, it, but if you look at the take-up rate, it's about 2%. So, so, and uh, a lot of the state-level studies on you know, how much, what is the take-up rate, what's holding these workers back, are things like, well, you first you have to qualify for the FMLA right. to get the leave. Uh, only then is a job protect, protected. Uh, so the FM, FMLA basically requires you to put in those 1,000 hours of work and uh, meet other conditions. So a lot of them take the leave, but then it's not job protected if they don't qualify under the FMLA. Uh, and secondly, the wage replacement rates are 50 55%, 60%. Right. And, and a lot of you know, women employees complain, well, that's not 
enough. We are already earning a low income, and then 50% of that is not a huge wage replacement rate. So I really worry, uh, you know, Heather, to your point about how much do we uh, learn from these state-level programs. So I agree, you know, there are a lot of studies out there saying, well, employers are not affected. But if that's, you know, basically coming from the fact that a lot of employees are not taking it up anyway. I mean, there are also stories about, you know, employees saying, well, you know, we're forced to take vacation days or paid sick days before we can even take family leave. So, yeah, it's not a burden on employers, but are we really learning, like, is that the model that we could apply at the federal level? And I would just, you know, like all of you to sort of comment on that. Have we really learned a lot from the state-level programs, given the low take-up rates, given the sort of problems employees talk about in uh, accessing these programs? So, I, I, well, I, first of all, never want to extrapolate from California to the whole U.S. It's just... <laughs> I have an issue with that. But um, the, the serious part is, in general, I think you, you, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of sort of the real yeah. amount of experience we have is pretty limited. On the other hand, it's the data we have. So you have to you know, sort of study it. I, I, there's no reason not to. But I always worry about extrapolating from a state-level program to a federal right. program. Federal programs get, in general, more attention. Um, they, they often have better enforcement Research. and... Yeah. Um, I, I just don't think you learn enough from a single state or even these three states. Um, so I, I do worry about that quite a bit. So a couple of notes. Um, so, I mean, California is what, like 10% of the U.S. population? I mean, it's huge. I, I think it's actually, it's a very important and it's a very diverse state. Um, it's got both rural and urban and different kinds of folks and it's got a lot of businesses and a lot of businesses that work in California and in other places. So I think there's actually a lot that we can learn about the experience and on the uh, employer side um, as well. Um, and I'm sure that there are people in the audience who might know more about certain studies that I don't really have in my head on that, but hopefully we can get to some of that in the Q&A. But, so I actually think we can learn a lot from that implementation. We can also learn a lot from what other countries have done. Right. Um, one of the things that we've learned, um, two big things that we've learned from other countries uh, that I'll just note, um, one is that very, very long leaves reduce women's employment um, and aren't good for gender equity. And by very long leaves, I mean leaves in the, in the multi-year, year or multi-year length. Um, and I will note that, that none of us are talking about that. I think the, right. the outer bound of what, of what has been mentioned up here today is the 16 weeks in D.C., which I think has already been pared back in the, the, the revisiting of that legislation and the 12 weeks in the Family Act is really the outer bound, which is what we have under the Family Medical Leave Act. There's no evidence that that has a negative effect on women's employment. And in fact, actually, the evidence is it leaves that are that short actually improve retention. Right. So that's a big thing that we can learn internationally. Um, and I think is is underscored by what we've learned from the states. Um, uh, another thing we've learned that that we can learn from the states that Bell pointed to is um, if we care about gender equity, one of the most important things we need to do is you can't have inequity in in who is taking off work to care and equity in the workplace. That'll never that just that will never work, right? So if we think that both men and women are caregivers, if we think that women are fully participating in the labor market, then we need to make sure that women that men I'm sorry that men have a hundred percent equal access and can use these kinds of uh, benefits. And I, so I actually think that one of the most important things we learn is that the United States, unlike every other country, when we implemented unpaid leave and in the three states that have paid leave, it's 50-50 men and women. You got a baby and it's, it's, it's two parents and they're male and female or if they're whatever. Um, you have two of them, they each have the exact same amount of use it or lose it leave, right? So a new child born in the state of California, the parents have the same amount of caregiver leave. Now the mom gets a little bit more leave to recover from childbirth, so that's different because she's actually got to have the baby, but if the child is adopted, the two parents get the exact same amount. And that is different than other countries where the leave is tied to the child typically, not to the worker. So question on that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I, you couldn't have a federal program that gave differential leave to men and women. It would violate the Equal Protection Clause. Right, I mean, yes, you, but no, exactly. That's, that's not so on that's the a, table. No, that's, <laughs> no it's, but it's a good thing. But what that means, though, yeah. right, so I was just pointing to, to, to Bell's point about other countries have had to actually Sorry, do that later. Yeah. We we start from that, and what we what it's shown is exactly what Bell mentioned. But what we learn from the states is if you give men money for doing something, they'll take it, right? If you give them paid leave, they'll take it up, and you've seen this very sharp 
increase. Now, guess it's starting from low levels, but that's one big thing we've learned from California. So even though the wage replacement is low, relatively, men are taking it up, and that's really, really important. It's a big thing that we've learned. Um, but when, on the point, they, by the way, this is just such a, 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 an interesting factoid from that paper. They're taking it when the first baby is a boy. Yes, oh. you're not taking it when they have daughters. It's really interesting. Well, they're less likely to take <laughs> it. They do, yes, sad. yes. But we know from other research that dads really matter. So it's a, this is that's a complicated yeah. that's, that's a complicated, complicated one. But yeah, just yes. thought I'd. Yeah, well, we could, that, let's have long, that's a good one. But I want to make one point on um, FMLA. Um, so this is a really big issue, yeah. right? Um, the Family Medical Leave Act um, is, a, you know, you can get 12 weeks of unpaid leave if you work at a large firm and you've worked at least a year, right. you know, so many hours. It, it all of that means that only about a little over half, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the total U.S. labor market for that's workforce yes. is covered. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people in California aren't covered. There's two ways of looking at that. One is that we probably should expand the FMLA. Right. That's one, one strategy. But the second is that that means that you've got 40% or more of the labor market for whom when they have one of these life events happen, they're, they, they, they're hit on both ends. They right. both could lose their job and they have no income and almost by, by definition, they're not eligible for unemployment insurance. So it is a challenge, but even the fact that they have that program in California, it gives them more, more. than they would have. Other, so, right. so I a hundred percent agree we need to fix that, but it's still better than the alter, better than the status quo in, in other states. Wait, Isabel, do you want to add to that? Uh, I, I think that uh, action is going to be at the state level for quite some time now right. for purely political reasons. Right. Uh, I mean, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, uh, I think that the fact that we have some consensus now that something should be done uh, make, can make us more hopeful that something could happen at the federal level. But uh, I think probably uh, we're going to be going down the state route and that this is going to uh, happen fairly rapidly. Uh, there, there will be a momentum here, and states will copy other states. And I hope that we can use states then as a laboratory uh, to, to learn new good. things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that um, another thing I want to mention on the gender equity issue, you have a lot of single parents. Right. And they are overwhelmingly women. And they are a group that are concentrated at the bottom in low-wage jobs, uh, and so we do need to worry about them. And my colleague Richard Reeves and I at Brookings and has been particularly interested in this issue, and he has talked to me about how he might write something on allowing um, dads of the children in single-parent families, the absent dads, to pay off some of their child support in time. In time. Uh, yeah, uh, have you seen really anything on that? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. So, you know, I, I just want to throw that out as an interesting idea to possibly uh, follow up on. That's uh, I think you were kind of worried about the uh, job protection issue. Right, that's and brilliant. I think you're right to worry about yeah. that, and there's no reason why that couldn't be part, uh, of, the baby part of this. Yeah. Baby programs. So it's just a, a, a yeah. minor uh, point. Well, first of all, on Quebec, Quebec's full of interesting experiments. Yeah. I forget the exact details, but you know, in the mid 20th century, when the the French descendants in Quebec were scared of the rest of Canada, they decided to, to adopt a policy called revenge of the cradle, and they paid for <laughs> kids. And the average family size was eight. Um, so oh they've done God. some very dramatic things <laughs> in Quebec. Um, um, but on on this this issue, I think it's really important not only to do the research, but to actually ask the American people what they like. Hey. And here's why I think that um, there have been proposals that basically substitute. Uh, time and a half on overtime, and instead give you time off. Essentially, you know, Make work it work it off in choose, time kind yeah. of thing. Um, which sounds, from like an, an economist's point of view, that's flexible. You get to pick what you want. What could be better? I love that. The American people hate it. Like if we go out and poll it, what they really believe, particularly women, is they won't get either. They won't get the money, and they won't get the time off. And so it, it, there's like no support for that. Um, and so it's one thing to sort of think about clever policy designs. I, I, I'm uh, I'm going to echo what Bell said, but but simpler is better, and asking people if it makes sense to them is a politically important part of the sale. 
So, and we, there is a lot of polling on, on the different ways of doing that. And I mean, first off, Americans of all stripes want paid family medical leave, um, be they Republicans, Democrats, right. independents, men, women. Women want it more, Democrats want it more, but it's over 50% among all groups. So this is, it's fantastic that we're talking about it right. finally because the American you people want it. Um, it. People are also willing to pay for it. Um, and they want it to be meaningful. So, um, but there's, you know, happy to give to, you know, yeah. afterwards talk about that. But uh, one, uh, one just quick thing on the job protection piece to really think about. So the Family Medical Leave Act, part of the reason that you have to be at your job for a year, right, is that we didn't want to burden yeah. um, employers. And I think that there's some real, uh, there's a real debate about, like, if we want to cover everybody, um, we want to cover more people. How far do we want to bring that down? Do you think that if I've been on the job for a month and then I need to take 12 weeks <clears> off, I should be able to keep my job two months, three months? Now, a year might be the outer bound. Personally, I think you know something closer to six months seems more, more, more apt. You want to get over a typical sort of um, period. But I think one question is what would be the right... Um, number length of, of time, yeah. a length of time if you want that job protection and so you said put them together I actually think personally that we should that they should be separate you should get the money no matter if you have job protection or not but because you need the time and you aren't eligible for it for unemployment insurance if you lose your job but 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 how but how, what should we demand of employers to take somebody back how quickly right so on that, I mean, the issue then becomes what is the burden of protecting the, this job? Yeah. And um, I don't know the answer to this. I right. just know that we have run the experiment at some level because if a, if a reservist in the United States is called up, oh. their job is protected with the employer. And sadly, we have called up a lot of reservists and, and deployed them for extended periods of time. And those jobs have all been protected. So we could go find out. That's a really good point. A very, very good point. I, 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 t I mean, the question about you know, six months, a year, or whatever, as a, a criteria for um, protection and for, for leave, I think is a really important one. I, I tend to want to go a little longer uh, because I want people to have a real attachment to both the labor force and to a specific employer before we ask that employer uh, yeah. to pay. To pay yeah. uh, and I, you know, I hear what you're saying, Doug, about the American public has certain views of this. <laughs> but I think basically um, that's based on very high level kinds of surveys and that if you get right down into people's actual lives, they want flexibility. I mean, I think Senator Fisher talked about yeah, that. Yeah. And so I would favor a design that tries to uh, maximize flexibility um, in some way. So would I. So I was, would I was yeah, surprised by the results yeah, of that. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the point. Right. Can yeah, I make yeah, one sure. comment on that, Bell? So one interesting comment about that is that, um, about the job protection piece, is when you look at the labor market, who is it that's only been at their job for a year or less? People in their 20s. Yeah. And so many of the people, if we want young people to be able to have the time that they need with their parents, we need to recognize that it's, that I, as a labor economist, I know that one of the best things that a young person can do in their 20s if they want to see career progression is to switch jobs and to move up, right? And you see that. People in their 20s have, you know, jobs for just a couple of years. Maybe they just get out of school. But that is the time when people start families. And so in, in, in some number crunching I did with John Schmidt a number of years ago, we found out that if you look at African-American women between the ages of 18 and 25 with, an, with a child, an infant at home, half of them are ineligible because of the job tenure requirement for FMLA. And I'm like, well, but if they, they're, wait, they're young and they have a baby, isn't FMLA, you know, for them? So that's, there's, a, I have a big question there too. I'd love to hear. Yeah, no, I, I, I tell you what my, my pushback on that is. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I'm torn because as you say, yeah. there are a lot of people mm -hmm. in that situation. My argument would be looking to the future and not to the need right now. We want to encourage people to have a stable job before, before they, they have, have a baby. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and if we reduced unplanned pregnancies, now I'm yeah. going back to my Your, book, Generation yeah. Unbound, uh, we would have a lot more people who had already uh, figured out that they needed to have a stable job before they had a family. Yeah, it's a good... It's Finally, a good. and just quickly on the gender pay inequity issue, which, you know, it's not a coincidence that we're talking about uh, paid family leave and gender pay inequity, because to my mind, a big reason why this inequity in wages that you see in the BLS data arises or in, uh, you know, in the wage data arises 
is because if you, once you start controlling for, well, how much time are women actually sure. spending in the workforce and when are, they, when are they dropping out, you know, a lot of the, the wage gap economists say disappears and where do you stand on that so so Heather you mentioned some studies that say you know, women are not good at negotiating and they come out of school and they're uh, you know they they get paid less to begin with but there are also studies that say well if you look at Harvard MBAs and they're coming out and you know their first job they earn the same and then somehow five years later you know those women are raising children and they have a family and their and their pay is a lot lower than what the men are earning and so uh, you know how much of how much of this do we think is discrimination as we understand it from the employer perspective and how much of it is, uh, you know, the, these sort of work-life policies and, and choices that are made by women. And, and so, uh, you know, in, in relation to the act that Senator Fisher just talked about, I mean, how much <coughs> of this kind of discrimination would be addressed by somebody being able to say, well, what is my salary relative to my coworker? And, uh, you know, would that address those kind of inequities, really? So, so I don't know the answer to that, but, but here's yeah. how I think about it. I mean, if you look at the gap, the raw gap right. between men and women, and start controlling for things, the biggest way to, to narrow it down is exactly what you said, control for how much time as experience in the labor force, tenure on the job, right. and it's the interruptions for family uh, issues that take a man and woman of the same age and, and make them look very different. That doesn't get rid of all of it, though. And right. so the question is, how much of what's left is discrimination? Just pure discrimination. Just pure discrimination. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know what that number yeah. is, but I see no reason why it should be anything other than zero. Exactly. And if we can set in place policies that would enhance that, uh, I'm in favor of that. So the transparency seems fine. Heather's more versed in these uh, anti-retaliation issues, and I think that's important to think about. I, I, you know, I have to learn more about that. But certainly, the transparency makes sense. Okay. I, I mean, so. Uh, there's a lot. There's been a lot of research over the past 15 years or so on the motherhood pay penalty and the right. fatherhood pay bonus, essentially. Um, and one thing that we learned from that, and one of the the scholars that um, I turned to, and who's done fantastic work on this, is Michelle Budig, who's at uh, UMass Amherst. Um, what they found is that the the bulk of the gap between the wages between among women is actually due to a motherhood pay penalty. Exactly. Um, I, uh, my reading of the literature is that the, one of the biggest pieces of the, 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 the pay gap that remains has to do with occupational segregation, the kinds of jobs that men and women yep. are exactly. in, yeah. and the um, lack of uh, equal take up and access to policies to address work-life conflict. Right. And those two are actually connected. There's been some research work by Claudia Golden from Harvard University showing that at the top end, um, uh, women have chosen particular um, part, particular occupations Patient. because they actually um, have been not not more flexible but more amenable right. to um, to balancing to finding ways to ad address work life conflict. And the example that sticks in my my mind of, of its talk that she gave a, a couple of years ago was that women are more likely to join larger um, hospital groups. Um, if they're OBGYNs, because if you join a large group, then you've got other colleagues that you can tag team with. So it's not just you on your own, whereas men are more likely to be able to thrive in an environment where they're, where it's like they just go out and put a shingle up because they can work the 24-hour um, right. uh, time frames. And so that has, these, these are parts of sort of, but she encourages to think about what's actually happening at the workplace, not just above and beyond the paid leave, right. but how are you actually structuring work, which I think goes a long way. I mean, the transparency is important, but I think fundamentally, if we want to address gender equity, we have to address the other kinds of things we're talking about here. Thank you. I, I would just want to uh, reinforce something that you and the uh, person from the Women's Policy Research uh, Group said earlier, which is we should be collecting uh, the broad data in order to identify potential bad actors. I mean, it's just a prima facie case. Mm. It, it needs mm -hmm. a lot more analysis and uh, in-depth look. But you need, a for, for efficiency, you need a first screen to decide where the bad actors might lie as opposed to constantly just dealing with an individual case I mean, we all know that there are a zillion individual cases, uh, some of which have merit and some of which do not. Yeah. And that's a very expensive and uh, way to, to go about 
figuring out where there's discrimination. Great. We're finally Super. turning to the audience. I hope you're full of questions for <coughs> us. Uh, who wants to begin? Adele. Hi, um, my name's Marnie Morata, and it's a great panel, so thank you. Um, and I just had two questions, actually. The first is um, on the Family Act. So when it comes to pregnancy discrimination and the bills that are floating in that area and that space, one of the biggest issues is that you don't want to describe a pregnancy as a disability. Mm -hmm. But in the Family Act, and a, a lot of the, even the state programs um, depend on a short-term disability model. So how do you square those? Or is it more of just having to work in the framework that we're in and just accepting that, that that's the best solution? And then the other question I have is on the equal pay portion. Um, this issue's obviously become very politicized. So how do we get past that and actually get to something we can do together? Do you want to talk uh, to yeah, so on, the, um, so on the pregnancy as disability, I, I, I'm an economist, and so I, I will just use that as my introduction to say that I've thought less about um, some of the language issues that my lawyer friends are, are actually, they're, you know, I'm here for the charts, they're here for the, you know, specific words. Um, but I think that the challenge with the, um, with the pregnancy as a non I 100% I understand why we don't want to describe it as a disability. It's it's not necessarily disabling, for, although for some people it can be. Um, but the way that we've set up our temporary disability insurance programs that cover 40% of the labor market is that pregnancy is considered um, something that you can actually get that insurance for. It's um, in the five states that have statewide temp temporary disability in insurance programs, pregnancy is covered. We don't want to undo that because it's, it's a really important time in a woman's life and in a child's life, um, but I understand the, the challenges with, with, with labeling something it, that it's not, but it's one of those moments where you, you, don't want, you, also, you don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good, but I leave it to people who know more about the ins and outs of that debate, but I, I appreciate the question. I, I totally agree with what everything Heather just said and, and also uh, burdened by being an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do I must say that when I first heard ditto that a lot ditto. of these, <laughs> a lot of these programs are funded through disability, I was like, why? Why disability? You know, you're absolutely right. It, it's sort of, you know, why? Why do we need these systems to fund something as uh, basic, maybe as maternity leave? Um, any other questions? Yeah. Hi, my name is Maria Saab. I work for Deloitte. Um, I am a lawyer and not an economist, but <laughs> in working on some of these paid leave <laughs> issues, I've been thinking, and this is sort of controversial because I'm a woman and definitely believe in equal pay, but it seems like striving for 100% equal pay is going to be unrealistic in the market economy that we have. Is there an acceptable range that we could s strive Maybe for? Maybe it'll be 110. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is there sort of a number a that we could get to? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> is there a number that we could get to that would be acceptable and for the pay gap? I mean, it's not morally acceptable, but what is something business can ascribe to? Or I, so, uh, yeah, well, okay. Well, I, I was going to follow up on my quasi-joke here. I mean, um, sure, 100% is going to be way too clean and bright a line. On the other hand, you shouldn't think that women are always going to earn less than men. That's After true. all, Women are much better, younger women are much better educated than men now. That's true. 60% yeah. uh, of BA degrees are going, going to, to women, run. and they are now earning the majority of graduate degrees as well. So based on education alone, and we don't have the experience yet because this tends to be the younger generations, but uh, you'd expect women to be earning more, not less. I just want to put that on the table. That's a great point. underscore. <laughs> yeah. Bulls. Yeah. So that's that's all absolutely right. And and um I but I think the key is you want to eliminate behaviors, not not a number or a pay gap. That's you, true. You know, discrimination on the basis of gender is wrong. And that's that should be the ideal, not the the difference that comes from the accumulation of experience, you know, that that that, that differential is going to be what it is. A different way to say it is you want a system where people are paid on merit. And um, one of the things that goes wrong 
in, in the labor force. Sorry, this is a, I'm, I'm going to attack unions because Heather's here. Um, no, but if you have these rigid systems of pay that are that are strictly based on tenure and people are taking time off, they're stuck behind. It has nothing to do with merit, and and you got to get rid of that. Mm -hmm, that's right. Thank you. My name is Li Yang. Uh, we are all talking about just research analysis. The problem is now about data accountability is, is very serious in trouble. And so a, a lot of employment also doing the, this service, whether you are educated or not. And then and we are talking about uh, complaint or court cases. A lot of the, those cases are biased or distorted or destroyed. So if you don't have a real verification of the data, so it's very difficult to say what law implementation is right or what proposal is right. And a lot of institutions, they don't even allow people to give the suggestions or comments. And a lot of comments are all destroyed, let's say, by Department of Labor or by Department of Justice. So we, I just wonder if we can make some effort to really verify all those problems. I think you made this point uh, earlier with the senator, and I think I'd say the same thing she said, which is, um, you know, we, we do have to worry about efficient uh, enforcement. And uh, I, senator, I emphasize on the legislation part. Uh, here I'm talking about the real life. It's totally different from our uh, Okay, sorry if employer. I'm not understanding, yeah. So, so more employer best practices, like how do you make sure that they feel safer in those work environments? Right. It's the retaliation. Right. And that is, I mean, Doug's right, it, that is about the retaliation. I mean, right. I think, um, you know, uh, it is it is challenge. you know, most American workers are are at-will employees. You can be fired for any reason at any time. And you can it, you can walk away from your job at any time, but you can also be, so so how people, how all, how we implement all of these things, and the way I always think about it is how you have those conversations, yeah. right? Who do you feel safe talking to at your workplace where you can actually have a conversation about, um, you know, the, the path that you should take, or if you fear discrimination, you know, do you want to talk to your colleague? Do you feel comfortable talking to your boss? Do you have an advocate that, that, that you can talk to? And then that, I think, is, in my mind, one of the biggest things we've lost with unions is just literally that shop steward down the hall or on the shop floor that you can talk to. Um, and, and so that makes it dip more, and it, it also means we don't have a lot of information inside firms um, in terms of what's going on. You don't, you have what the firm tells you, but you may not, you don't have any sort of other kind of uh, information coming out because unions can also say this is what we see going on so you get those varying perspectives and can learn a lot about what's going on inside so I take that I think that's an issue it's, it's great Hi, Vicki Shabo from the National Partnership for Women and Families. And I want to underscore what Heather said, which is we've been working on this issue for a long time. And the fact that we are having this conversation here and that basically everybody, including the senator, has agreed that this is an issue whose time has come, I think is a huge, huge uh, testament to the fact that the American public, the American workforce, and even American employers are changing their views on how we need to be thinking about this issue and updating our public policies. Um, I had a couple of comments about the state programs and what I think we've learned from them, um, and, a, and a couple of questions. So on the state point, yeah. I do think that there is a lot of evidence out there about what works and what doesn't. Um, we know the 55% wage replacement is too low, and in fact, there's a bill on the governor's desk right now to raise the wage replacement rate for low-wage right. workers in California. We know that the lack of job protection is an issue, and in fact, in Rhode Island, the paid family leave is job protected now, and that seems to be working well. Um, we know that equal buckets for women and men is important, and we've seen both the rise in California and also a higher rate of men taking leave in Rhode Island even in the first year compared to California's first year and New Jersey's first year. Um, so we know something. We know 66% wage replacement, as is in the Family Act, might be about right, at least as a starting place. Um, we know that, that uh, one of the barriers in New Jersey is that the maximum wage replacement rate is too low, but California's is better, so around $1,000, it makes sense. So we know things. Um, and as Heather said, California is a, a huge portion of the US economy, so I wouldn't, it's the left coast, but I wouldn't throw it out entirely. <laughs> um, 
We also know a lot about take up in those states, both from TDI and also from the paid family leave program. And even if you adjust for some of these factors that might discourage leave, I think we know that sort of the range of estimates for each kind of leave taking for women and men. So I think we actually have a lot of information, which leads to my question um, for, for Doug and for anybody else, which is how much more evidence do we need to think about a social insurance program as the, a national social insurance program as the most efficient way for administering a benefit that sets a floor for everybody. Of course, employers can improve upon that. There's always room for more flexibility. Um, but one of the challenges that we face in the US and that particularly low wage workers face is that in the inequality that we see in leave benefits begets more inequality. So we know that kids have worse outcomes, which then leads to further costs down the road. We know that having a family caregiver with you at a time that you have a serious illness can minimize costs and reduce medical issues. We know that when people have access to TDI, they're more likely to return to work. And of course, we've already talked about women being more likely to return to work. We've also talked about small businesses in particular uh, having a benefit from a social insurance program that spreads the cost of leave. So I'm sort of, I guess my question is, how much more do we need um, to be able to evaluate the benefit of a national social insurance program? So, so I mean, from, from my point of view, I think you have um, a sort of set of technical questions that, you know, people have different levels of comfort on. Uh, what, what should be replacement rates? What should be maximum durations? What should be, what will be likely take up rates? Uh, all of which lead to the fundamental question of, will this, in fact, be a self-financing um, uh, benefit, or will it, in fact, produce a, a surplus or a drain on the Treasury, which you, you cannot have the conversation at the national level without being very sure of those answers, in, given the, the budgetary environment. So I, th I think that's important. There's a second set of things that you have to, quote, know, which is, why is it these other places don't have this? Those are special places because they actually adopted family leave programs. And so generalizing from them is actually something I worry about for precisely that reason. This is a self-selection issue. So I, I, I would be much more comfortable knowing what the good folk of Nebraska think about this and how they would behave and, you know, Texas and, and the rest. So, you know, those are the issues about sort of national scale versus states that I, I really am concerned about. I'd like to make one comment on just that, that last point, um, which is that the reason that we have these programs in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island is because they were able to tap into the infrastructure of a longstanding temporary disability insurance, insurance program, program that was set up in the 1950s. We only have two other states in the United States that have that infrastructure, Hawaii, and which to a less extent, it's a different kind of program, and New York, and New York is considering it. Um, I worry about states that don't have TDI programs setting up a standalone program because I worry about the administrative cost and expense. And so I think an interesting question, a follow-up question to Vicky's is that um, what's special about those three states is they, they already had the infrastructure. And, um, and if we want a federal program, I don't know that I want Nebraska to spend the time, the energy, and the resources to set up a standalone program if in five years we're then going to have a federal program that would. Right. So I, and I worry that, that it's not efficient. So, so part of actually why I feel that this is urgent now is I'm like, we have three states. Hopefully, we'll have New York soon. And then, then actually, let's be, if we're going to do federal, then let's do it. Do and it. if we're never going to do federal, let's make that decision because because otherwise it's we'll a lot be of wasting it's more efficient yeah, yeah. and I, what would you say to that just i don't know what you react I, I, it's the it's the basic trade off right yeah. which is you know sort of um, you replicate overhead costs if you do it in every state but you get the benefit of the the laboratories of experimentation yeah. and that's a real benefit uh, something that that's uh, been important for policy design in the past um, i think if you know as as a matter of just raw political judgment if New York State does it, I think it's going to be a tough sell to one side of the aisle to say, look, California, New York, New Jersey, it's all good. Let's yeah. go. I'm I just want to <laughs> add that your website is fabulous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> benefited from your materials. So thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Emily Alexiou. I'm a graduate student um, from New York University. We're here with the social work program. Um, I'm kind of trying to understand this is kind of a new topic for me. And again, thank you for having us. I'm a former um, high school teacher, and I'm from a state that was non-union. But we did have a really good bartering program. And I'm trying to kind of understand 
the the two sides of the union. For me, it was great coming in knowing that I had equal pay and somebody that was um, advocating for me as a woman. I knew what I was making, and I did hear um, Mr. Holtz can say that your to me it seemed like it was kind of that it was an anti-union um, statement. Excuse me if I. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead to say that, that you were saying <laughs> it um, that it was, excuse me, I feel a little shaky, um, uh, that there was, uh, you, you were capping out and that why couldn't we go on to um, barter for more money? But for me, it was a really positive thing. And maybe I misunderstood, again, your statement, but I'm, again, learning. Um, and I guess I was just trying to understand, you know, kind of the two sides to this. And if there could... Um, so, so to clarify what I said, what I worry about is that often with unions, and this is not a, a theoretical proposition that has to be true, you get um, bargained rigid pay schedules that are often very dependent on time on the job and seniority. And if you do that, if you're in such a system and you take time off, you get behind and you stay behind. And women take off more for family reasons. And so that interaction is, is what I, I, I don't like, and that's what I'm worried about. until you took time off and then you came back and found yourself behind the person, the male you started with, and never catch up. You might be just as good a teacher when you came back, or yeah. should you yeah. be penalized for the fact that you took a year off to, to take care of a child? Yeah, that's the issue. But, oh, but my understanding is that unions do help women gain more higher wages. You know, there's an interesting history here that you could look up. Um, in the original Equal Pay Act was enacted in um, 1963. And uh, I actually um, am old enough to remember that. And uh, I was even in graduate school not too long thereafter. And uh, I, my uh, lead professor in graduate school suggested to me that I write my doctoral dissertation on the pay gap between men and women. And I went back and did an entire historical analysis of that pay gap. And one of the things that I hadn't even known, and I bet a lot of people in this room don't know, is that there were actual separate pay scales for men and women teachers. I mean, obviously not anymore. But you know, back before uh, the war, World War II anyway, there were completely separate pay scales with much lower pay for women. And it'd be interesting to research what role unions played, because unions were very big yeah. back in the 1930s, 40s, whatever, uh, what role they played in getting rid of those separate pay scales. I don't, I don't know the answer. That's a good question. I don't know. That's a good question. Just very brief clarifying question. Uh, comment. The first one is, you're absolutely right, people get penalized for being out of mm -hmm. the labor market. The penalties are much higher in the non-union sector than they are in the union sector. But the other issue is litigation in, um, in, in the US, it hasn't been such a big issue, but litigation compares, you know, like for like. So you have to, you can say, okay, you're out a year, it takes you two years to catch up. Now you are the same as the person who has been there throughout. So time out in the law isn't an absolute excuse for, um, for difference in pay. And I think the unions, they certainly played a big role in getting those differences historically, but unions have changed a lot. And unions are now addressing the issues of inequality, including in terms of pay. So I think unions are dynamic, and they are more accountable right. in addressing those type of differences than some other employment organizations are. Hi, uh, I guess it's somewhat related and going back to sort of retaliation issues and safe space, and there's a tendency to sort of 
isolate and not look at the intersections, and to speak, for example, of women not being as good negotiators. But there's a whole host of other things happening. If your education is lower, there's age difference, there's race, first generation immigrants and cultural, um, you know, where you're inclined to negotiate or even engage in that kind of a thing. And so I think that, you know, those sorts of things really need to be brought into the picture as well and the conversation. Um, and it's really important. There's a whole host of people who are affected by this. I don't think any of us would disagree yeah. with the f importance of looking at other factors. And the, the, the Paycheck Fairness Act would um, provide negotiation training not just for one group, but for anybody who, you know, so would, it would be able to address many of those issues. Because it is about how you, how you cope with all of those differences in the workplace. Hello, uh, thank you very much for this panel. I was very interested in your uh, comment about uh, a woman starting off uh, uh, coming out of college, uh, more women coming out of college, more women coming out of grad school. So I was wondering, uh, with that, I went to Washington Lee when they went to co uh, back in 1985. We now have more women there than we had uh, <laughs> ever. Uh, but uh, are, they, are women now starting off behind men, or are they starting off on an equal play playing field and then, and then regressing? Uh, there is a one study um, by the, I think it was by the Federal Reserve Board of New York, uh, that showed that amongst young women uh, and equalizing education uh, and a few other things, they are doing quite well. I mean, that the pay gap is virtually um, gone. gone. Uh, now, I won't speak to whether that study is the best study in the world. I don't know if either of you are familiar with it or you. No, I think of... we've found conflicting studies. Yeah. Yeah. It, it depends yeah. on which cohort and which right. what you're looking at. But there are, you know, there are studies that say that, as I said, you know, if you're coming out of a Harvard MBA and everybody who's on the market gets a job and is paid, uh, you know, the same, but then a few years down is where the gaps really start to emerge. And then I'm sure there are studies that say, you know, women are not good at negotiating, and so they start off at a lower lower scale. And um, the study I was sure. referring to is from the American Association for University Women. Um, and even if the gap um, when you start is in the single digits, even if it's 5%, yeah. there shouldn't be a gap in your first year in, on the job. And that's the point. And that the right. gap, then when you follow people over the over 10 years, the gap grows over time. So so that, so so it, so uh, 5%, that's not that big at the beginning, but it's the growing it that you have to be up. sort of thoughtful about. OK, I think I saw one last question there, and then. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm also a graduate social work student at NYU. Um, so I know that there's a limit to the scope of any legislation, and we're talking about paid family leave, and we're also talking about uh, gender pay inequality. And many studies have demonstrated that men and women don't spend equal time on housework, on things like child rearing. And so when we're talking about um, gender pay inequality, I wonder how we kind of can remove the conversation about um, child care, accessibility, um, other programs that can help mothers who do tend to pick up the majority of the family work, um, how we can address that. Because without that, the gender pay inequality really seems to me like something that um, can't necessarily come to fruition or be part of the conversation. Uh, I think uh, it's great that you raised that question. I want to use it to um, give a bow to some work that Aparna has done on the uh, child care tax credit. Uh, the child care tax credit right now provides, uh, first of all, as a general point, I think that actually child care is more important than paid family leave. So if we were all here and we were asked the question, what should we really be focusing on to create more gender equity, I, I personally would put child care at the top of the list. But then in terms of the policies we currently have, we have a child care tax credit. We also have a block grant child care program right. that gives money to the states that provides uh, money for them to help uh, lower income families pay for child care. On the, ch on the tax credit, uh, which Aparna has written about, I've written about a little bit, and others have as well, uh, it is right now not capped at the top. In other words, you can have an income or earnings of $300,000 a year, and you still get this tax credit for child care. 
Um, and at the bottom end, because it's not refundable and can only therefore has value if you can offset it against your regular income taxes, and since low-income families by and large don't pay income taxes, uh, the people with incomes above, I mean, uh, excuse me, below about, what, 30000 a year or so, mm -hmm are getting no benefit at all, and that's the group that needs child care the most. And they're, as a result, often using uh, neighborhood care that might not be very high quality or leaving kids in front of the TV set because they just, uh, or with an unreliable relative because Absolutely. they just don't have any other choice. So I just really want to say that your question, I think, is right on target. I agree with Belle. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion and th please join me in thanking our panelists and thanks to all of you for coming here. Yeah.